The Great Smoky Mountains are an old place. The Appalachian mountain range that they belong to was as tall as the Alps when it formed, and today remains the tallest mountain range in the eastern United States. Since their formation, the mountains have eroded considerably and become short enough to be almost entirely covered in trees. This creates a unique climate, with temperate rainforests covering part of the range. The moisture from the plants and the nearly incessant rain create the frequent fog and signature blue hue of the mountains. Visible even on clear days, it is these qualities that give the Smoky Mountains their name. The mountains were formally established as a national park in 1934, but before that, settlers lived in parts of their vast forest. One settler family, with the surname Martin, owned part of a meadow called Spence Field on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. The field was at the top of a mountain, reaching over 5,000 feet in elevation. The field occupies an expanse of many miles, reaching over 5,000 feet in elevation, running east to west along the ridgeline. The trees had largely been cleared, and the Martin family raised sheep and cattle, which grazed in the fields surrounding a sizable windmill they had on the property. Following the establishment of the mountains as a national park, the Martins had to move their sheep and cattle elsewhere. By the 60s, nature had begun to reclaim their pristine meadow as undergrowth and small trees moved in. Despite Mother Nature's reclamation project, the meadow remained clear enough that visitors would often come to see the plentiful wildflowers. The field remains the largest bald cap in the Smokies, and on a clear day, visitors can enjoy a majestic view of mountain peaks which can be seen for miles around. Though the Martins eventually moved away, their descendants settling in nearby towns and cities, they never forgot where they came from. Many of them would often visit the Smokies, hiking and camping, and enjoying the natural wonder that had been their ancestral homestead. Hi, I'm your host, Zach Williams. Welcome to Compulsion. The latest member of the Martin family to become infatuated with the mountains was six-year-old Dennis. He loved the outdoors and would often outpace his father on hikes. His family lived in Knoxville, but he'd often pester his father to take him on weekend trips to explore the mountains. His father, William, said in a later interview that, quote, The boy has spirit and loves to hike. He likes to jump from rocks and logs and sometimes wanders off to the side of the trail. William was an architect and had a busy schedule. But when the weather was nice, he would often take Dennis and his older brother, nine-year-old Douglas, on adventures in the mountains. William later spoke with the Tennessean about how much Dennis had enjoyed visiting the Smoky Mountains. Quote, Dennis loved the mountains. He always wanted to come up here every weekend to hike, and about every other weekend I would put my pencil down and bring him up here. William had been visiting the Smokies for much of his life and knew them very well. In June of 1969, Dennis was finally old enough to join in on the annual Father's Day trip to Spence Field, a tradition that many of the Martin family clan kept up with. Though the trip took place on Father's Day weekend, the trip was actually based around a historic family tradition. Mid-June was when the Martin family would renew the salt supplies for the cattle grazing at Spence Field. So they based their yearly pilgrimage to the field around that, keeping their tradition going. Dennis had been to the field two years prior, but not for an intensive overnight trip like this. Though Dennis was an experienced hiker, it was an overnight trip with at least seven miles of uphill hiking and an elevation gain of 4,800 feet from the starting point at Cades Cove. So this was the first year William thought Dennis was ready. On June 13th, they started at Cades Cove, an easily accessible large meadow and scenic part of the park. William's father, Clyde, came on the trip as well, 
and they had plans to meet up with more family members later on. From there, they hiked about five miles to Russell Field, an area leading into Spence Field. They spent the night at Russell Field with William's distant cousin Carter and his two boys, who were also there for the historic family trip. Sometimes the yearly pilgrimage would draw a dozen or more Martins. The group spent the night at Russell Field. Then the next day, they hiked about two and a half miles to Spence Field. Clyde's siblings, Doyle, Bob, Hughes, and Irma were all there, along with Bob's wife, Nita, and Doyle's daughter, Rita. The family all gathered near the shelter at Spence Field to prepare a meal and spotted a young, skinny-looking bear lurking near the edge of the field. Despite this giving some members of the group worry, William later said, quote, It was as bright and pleasant an afternoon as you can imagine. After lunch, the family group scattered somewhat, with William and Clyde hanging out near the shelter house, while all the Martin boys played together at the other end of a meadow, well within eyesight of William and Carter from the other edge of the field. William and Clyde were sitting in the shelter by the Anthony Creek trailhead at around 4.30 p.m. watching the boys play. Suddenly the boys started huddling. They whispered and giggled, looking not too subtly at William and Clyde, then suddenly ran into the woods. William was apparently familiar with this game, as he said many times that he knew what they were up to. They were planning on sneaking through the underbrush to surprise him and Clyde. But when Carter's sons and Douglas popped up out of the woods behind them, William and Clyde put on a good show of being scared while the boys laughed. Then they noted Dennis's absence. The boys explained that they'd had Dennis take a different route that was less visible, because he was wearing a bright red shirt and green khaki shorts. They figured it must have taken him a bit longer to get through. But then the minutes ticked by somewhere between three and five, and William became concerned. Dennis's great-aunt Irma Martin DeLoyser later said, quote, We were within 25 to 50 feet of the kids, and we saw him heading toward the trail toward the Tennessee side. In three minutes, all five of us sitting there were calling. We went up to the trail, and it was like he had vanished into thin air. There were numerous trails on the field, and the direction that the boys had sent Dennis was toward the Appalachian Trail. Some relatives had been watching the boys as they vanished, and the ones who had been further away were quickly gathered to search. Bob Martin, Dennis's great-uncle, later said that the area was not foggy when Dennis vanished. Quote, It was clear and pretty. I saw Dennis come to the left toward the trail, but in five minutes, I didn't see him anymore. We called and called, and there was no answer. Clyde and William went the direction Dennis had gone, while Doyle went south towards Hog Gap. He actually wandered into some brush and briefly got lost himself, because it was incredibly easy to get lost in that terrain. Meanwhile, Clyde traced the Appalachian Trail while William followed much of the nearby perimeter of Spence Field, then walked all the way back to Russell Field. All of the adults questioned hikers they came across, but none had seen Dennis. Most of the hikers they ran into were on the popular Appalachian Trail. They spent about two or three hours looking, then realized they needed help. Clyde went down to the Anthony Creek Trail to visit the ranger station and file a formal report, while William went to Boat Mountain Road, also heading towards Cades Cove. The other boys stayed with the women of the family while this was happening. By chance, the park naturalist, Terry Chilcote, and his wife were paying a visit to Spence Field. They'd taken Boat Mountain Road, which was a seven-mile road connecting the field to Cades Cove. A sturdy car could drive five miles up, and a jeep could make the whole road. But they stopped at the five-mile mark and hiked the remaining two, where they found the people, still up on Spence Field in distress and searching. The Chilcotes were informed of the search for Dennis around 7.38 p.m. They promptly hiked back to their car and picked up William, who had been making his way down the road. They dropped him off near the start of Boat Mountain Road. Clyde reached the station and filed the formal report at 8.30 p.m. The rangers who could be reached and were in the area joined in, about ten in all. 
Ranger Larry Nielsen sent Ranger Dennis Huffman to hike up the Anthony Creek Trail and inspect Russell Field. Nielsen drove to a paved area before Boat Mountain Road started and picked up William. It's not specified, but Terry likely had a radio in his car because Nielsen knew exactly where to get William. Nielsen brought William back up to Spence Field, and the Martin men continued their search with the aid of all available park personnel. They managed to look at every trail leading out of Spence Field except for one, the Eagle Creek Trail. They questioned any hikers and campers they came across, but none had seen the boy. It started storming very badly around 9 p.m., shortly after they'd started their search. The Martin family and rangers huddled in the shelter house during the worst of it. When the weather let up a bit, many of the rangers, including Larry Nielsen, elected to keep searching even in the dark. But their efforts were slow, and they didn't find much. They looked through much of the night. About three inches of rain fell that night, unfortunately eliminating any kind of trail the boy might have made. The search started early the next day. More park employees had been relocated to the area, and either the night of the 14th or the morning of the 15th, Ranger Mike Myers called a military doctor he knew in Knoxville, who told him he should call the Eastern Air Rescue Service if they wanted to get helicopters. Immediately, one was dispatched from McGee-Tyson Air Force Base. Myers also called the U.S. Forest Service District Ranger, who in turn called the colonel in charge of the Special Forces training in the area. He immediately started preparing troops to send in. The Special Forces were actually doing training maneuvers in the wilderness in North Carolina to prepare for the jungles of Vietnam, so he felt the men would be well-equipped to help. Many of them had already served and were experienced with dense forest terrain. Local hiking clubs familiar with the terrain were brought in, and a group of ranger scouts who were on a field trip nearby from Florida were mobilized, about 50 in total. One ranger was dispatched to walk the Eagle Creek Trail, as they hadn't walked it the previous day, while the other searchers were setting up to search in a grid pattern. The helicopter arrived that morning, but wasn't able to be used due to the heavy mountain mists from the previous night's storm. Conditions remained murky because it was raining on and off all day. Searchers either hiked up to Spence Field or were taken in small groups by Jeep up the Boat Mountain Road. Dwight McCarter, a young search and rescue officer, would later go on to write a memoir about his years and the Smokies and some of his journal entries would prove valuable in recounting the days of the search. He wrote of the search preparation that day that, quote, Although there are nine Jeeps and three trucks available today, every Jeep we can find is already in use to shuttle searchers up to Spence. The last mile or so near the top is the worst problem, because each vehicle headed up meets others coming down, and there are few places to pass. Over two and a half inches of rain fell last night in the storm. All of the streams are up and very turbulent, with most over their banks. The trail road up Boat Mountain is in bad shape with running water, mud, and washouts everywhere. It takes a long time to get to Spence. He also noted that it appeared the media had already started following the search. McCarter wrote that, quote, There are news people everywhere, and the search is beginning to look like some kind of sideshow with cameras and reporters shooting film and interviewing people. The bulk of the searchers worked in a grid pattern from where Dennis had vanished. They walked around 15 feet apart and used lines and markers to rope off areas already searched. Meanwhile, the rangers and more experienced searchers followed drainage areas and creeks further out. They thought that he may have gotten washed away in the storm, or had elected to follow a creek because he was experienced in the woods. At one point, dog teams were brought in, but they were informal and disorganized, and couldn't find much because of the rain. A group of Boy Scouts camping in the area was recruited that day and sent to walk the well-established trails, in case Dennis had found his way to one. All of the trails leading to Spence Field that day were searched. A few search and rescue groups had managed to arrive throughout the day, and altogether, an estimated 100 people helped with the search. Violet Martin, Dennis's mother, had received word that morning at church. 
She made it to the Smokies in the early afternoon. She stayed in Cade's Cove, which was quickly becoming the base of operations because it was reachable by car. She hadn't visited the Smokies as much as the Martin men, and remarked that, quote, it's a big place and everything looks about the same. Near the end of the day, McCarter wrote, quote, we have no luck in our rapid grid search, and returning to Spence, we encounter several dog teams returning without contacting Dennis. He seems to have dropped off the face of the earth without a sign. It is impossible to track when there are none. We ride jeeps down to the cove as it gets dark. The search went until dark that day, but nothing was found. The mist cleared enough at one point that the helicopter was able to make a few supply runs to Spence Field, and they set up for a smaller base there. Violet and William and several of their family members camped atop Spence Field for the night. The next day, Lieutenant Colonel H.D. Kinney dispatched 40 of his Green Beret Special Forces officers. The Air Force Base sent in 17 men along with an additional helicopter to aid in the search. They started at dawn, with search numbers around 160. With the military assisting and calling in favors, other veterans of the Vietnam War started showing up in informal groups. Their experience in the jungle proving exceedingly useful in a forest that was so dense that many searchers had to crawl on their hands and knees to get through the worst of the thickets. The heavy rains on the 14th and 15th made tracking tough, so searchers were relying on numbers, and let in pretty much any volunteer who showed up to help. However, one of the less experienced groups of civilian volunteers got lost almost right away in the thick underbrush. But they followed a stream to a familiar landmark and were able to find their way back to base. The search was somewhat disorganized, as the park had never dealt with the search this large before, and things were very rushed, as many felt certain they would find Dennis soon. That day, Dwight McCarter wrote about searching the areas known as Rocky Top and Little Bald. At Rocky Top, he wrote of finding engravings on the rock of visitors from the 17 and 1800s. At Little Bald, his search party found, quote, numerous old camps. Then, at Rocky Top, once again, to retrace their steps, they found, quote, many old backpacks, binoculars, cowbells, etc. Most are things that have been dragged off by bears from past camps on Spence. Bear activity was prevalent throughout the search. Those first few days, in addition to the young male bear spotted lurking about the field shelter house, searchers spotted a large sow with two cubs. She was bold, and her cubs were scrawny, and they would venture dangerously close to the shelter house, perhaps because they'd stolen food from there in the past, and had remembered that it could be found there. That night, a bear actually broke into the shelter house they'd stocked with supplies and stole a loaf of bread. Whether this was the sow or the skinny yearling spotted nearby is not specified. The media started to ask park employees about whether a bear could have snatched Dennis and they were very skeptical. Back in 1969, no one had ever been killed by a bear in the Smokies. In fact, the first fatal attack wasn't until 2000, so rangers were quick to tell the media that they didn't think bears could be responsible. As people settled in for the night, the papers interviewed Violet, who said Dennis had been on numerous camping and hiking trips and was very active. She thought he could certainly survive for a few days. But however outdoorsy he was, Dennis was only six, and was in a few special ed classes because he was about six months behind his age group academically. It had also been raining for two days. Though temperatures wouldn't get low enough to cause hypothermia, he might not be thinking straight. That night, Snedden met with search party leaders to plan an even more intensive search the next day. Quote, We'll expand our search area. We'll have about twice as many men in the area Tuesday as we had today. He called in more help from the Special Forces, who sent 100 more men from Fort Bragg, as well as another helicopter. The extra help arrived late in the day, so that night they had 300 men ready to kick off the search in the morning. This point in the search is where some papers start to differ quite a bit on the count of searchers present during each day, as well as minor facts that may contradict each other. Papers would often report on the previous day's activities as if it were happening currently, 
and the NPS official document on the search was admittedly rushed because they'd initially only put it together to give the governor an overview for an important meeting. Because of this, the document was not fact-checked. So, due to the errors in both, there is a bit of guesswork as to the actual number of searchers present each day, and exactly what happened on which day. On Tuesday the 17th, there was a heavy mist over the mountains that morning. Hundreds of additional people had shown up for the search. Park officials brought large groups to various search areas by jeep, but others who were less experienced stood by to wait for the rainy weather to clear. One searcher shot himself in the leg by accident. Of this incident, McCarter wrote, quote, One searcher accidentally shot himself through the right leg as he was unloading a pistol during the search earlier today. During this day of searching, we have heard many gunshots far off, and each time I wonder if the boy is found. Is this a way of communicating? Or if there are more people with gunshot wounds to the leg or foot? The treacherous terrain due to all the rain had Snedden rethinking letting all volunteers join. This is when Snedden ended up turning away some of the less experienced volunteers. Quote, What we want are organized groups, not stragglers who come in to volunteer. And we want men who are able to go through some rugged country. Around 400 people showed up, and the NPS estimated that they let about 365 of them participate turning away a handful of volunteers who did not seem equipped. Some hadn't brought water and admitted to never having set foot in mountain terrain before. The rain cleared around 11 a.m. and the army was able to use helicopters to bring people in to search the area. Though it was a seven-mile hike, it was only four miles by air, and the Boat Mountain Road was quickly becoming hazardous to drive on. They also set up a communication center on the field and gave search leaders walkie-talkies or radios. When the helicopter was done ferrying people, it soared over the mountains, looking for any areas that might have less fog and more visibility. Meanwhile, Snedden made the decision to bar the use of jeeps and off-road vehicles on the larger trails while it was still raining. The numerous tire tracks were making it treacherous for searchers to navigate those same trails on foot. They were also worried about tire tracks eliminating any new tracks that Dennis may have left if he had found his way to a trail. The NPS also started making efforts to limit visitor traffic to the areas being searched. That day, another branch of the military showed up to lend a hand. The U.S. Coast Guard offered boats and men to search the lake near Fontana Dam, as this was where many of the creeks from the Spence Field area poured out to. They would drop searchers off at the end of the creek and have them work their way up. At Spence Field, the search was completed by assigning small groups to an area, and if the group didn't have a lot of experience, another group would be sent to the same area to double-check them later. Searchers looked about 20 feet apart from one another. They covered the square mile surrounding the area Dennis was last seen in rather quickly. At one point, the searchers briefly thought they'd found Dennis. A young boy had wandered a bit away from his family fishing trip, and searchers thought he might be Dennis before his family came and got him. Despite this false hope, searchers were still optimistic. One Air Force soldier told the Tennessean that, quote, It will take a miracle, but I believe in miracles, and so do the rest of us out here. We're not about to give up. We've just got to pull this miracle off. An unnamed park spokesman was quoted in several articles as telling the media that he was certain Dennis would be found. Quote, He may be a little worse for the wear after being out in the open so long, but I'm confident we'll find him. Williams said the whole thing felt unreal, like a dream to him. He said he couldn't believe Dennis had been gone for two days. He still thought Dennis was absolutely alive, though. Snedden did not feel the optimism that many of the searchers felt. He said simply, quote, We're not about to give up the search, but it's looking pretty bad. At sundown, most of the searchers made their way back to Cade's Cove, as the shelter up at Spence's Field was limited. Though several of the more experienced searchers did opt to set up camps in the mountain, they set their tents up along the trails leading out of Spence Field and lit large bonfires, hoping that Dennis might spot them. 
One absolutely vital clue was found this day, but due to the lack of organization, did not make its way to the higher-ups in the search that day, but was announced in the papers. Claims of footprints found in the woods started to surface in numerous local and national articles. The Tennessean said that there were footprints found in the Eagle Creek drainage area about a mile from Spence Field. James Harmon, a member of the search crew, said, quote, We found footprints, one shoe on and one shoe off, about 2.30 in the afternoon. We followed the prints about 300 yards and then lost them in the branch that feeds Eagle Creek. This creek eventually runs into Fontana Lake, about 10 miles south of Spence Field. The search party believed the prints were fresh, as it had rained every night since Dennis had vanished. On both the 17th and 18th, once again the media quoted an unnamed park spokesman. The spokesman had made statements to the media that claims that Dennis's footprint had been found were false. He said they were, quote, rumors which ought to be spiked. It apparently took until later on the 18th for the park officials to be convinced of the footprint's legitimacy, and why they were so quick to discount the find as a rumor is unclear. Eventually, on the 18th, the Green Berets were dispatched to check the Eagle Creek area in response to the footprints. The Green Beret unit commander, Lieutenant Colonel H.D. Kenny, told the media that they were going wherever park officials directed and promised that wherever they were sent would be searched as thoroughly as possible. Quote, just give us an area and turn us loose. When we report on a block and say the boy ain't there, he ain't there. There were about 400 searchers that day, with a second unit of Green Beret soldiers brought in to be on hand to follow up on leads, or pick up where the other unit had left off. One source says 40 more were brought in, another says 22. The military troops were working long, borderline unsustainable hours, and troops would be brought in or sent home to keep them fresh, so it's a bit hard to keep track of the military searchers but it appears there were still around 100 Air National Guard troops helping with the search that day. McCarter wrote in his journal about the 18th, quote, We are now in the habit of riding up by jeep in the morning and riding down via helicopter in the evening, since early fog hampers helicopter operations almost every day. If it rains again today, the Boat Mountain Trail may no longer be passable, and search operations may be seriously curtailed. But the weather finally cleared that day, and they were able to mostly use the choppers to give the road time to dry. A U-10 airplane was brought in equipped with loudspeakers. They were planning on having William as a passenger on the plane, calling out and giving instructions over the forest for what to do for Dennis to most likely meet up with searchers. But when the craft landed, its stabilizer was damaged, and after a quick repair, it was sent back to base. Park officials that day remained optimistic. Assistant Chief Ranger Ed Widmer said, quote, We never give up hope. There has been plenty of moisture in the mountains, and you can live longer when you have water. Although the temperatures have dropped into the low 50s at night, I don't think the lad would have suffered too badly from exposure. Though other rangers pointed out that because the elevation is so high, it would be harder for him to find food. Not all of the searchers shared that optimism. Experienced hikers and mountaineers comprised a large portion of the search party, and they worried about the animals. There were black bears, boars, and poisonous snakes. One mountaineer, Maynard Ledbetter, told the media, quote, "They's black bears and bobcats and wild hogs up there. He could stumble into birch stools. That little fella's got a mighty slim chance. As the search started to receive more media attention, local psychics began calling in, but the attention also brought support from the nearby communities. Local women started to show up at the Cades Cove base with home-cooked meals and sandwiches. Their efforts, along with the Red Cross, ensured that there was plenty of food for the large number of searchers throughout the search. Much of the food supply came from local restaurants as well, who prepared meals and drove them up to Cades Cove. The media spoke with Violet that day, who was back home in Knoxville caring for Dennis's siblings, Douglas, Michael, and Sarah. 
She said the children were praying for Dennis. Quote, they pray every night under their grandmother's oak tree. Their prayers are simple, but they're theirs. She was leaning on her faith to get her through the ordeal. Quote, so far, God's helped me to be blank, so I don't think. I have a feeling we're going to find him. She said she makes a point to stay within hearing distance of the phone in case any word should come in about Dennis. She also told the media that she was thankful to all the searchers. Quote, God has made an awful lot of good people. Everybody has called to offer help in some way. One man in Gatlinburg just closed up his filling station and joined the search. Later that day, McCarter ended up near Haw Gap. He said, quote, I especially like the Blockhouse Mountain area and the Dearmond Bald, which are on either side of Haw Gap. There is evidence of old camps at Haw Gap. At Blockhouse Mountain, there is a large meadow on top of a lone mountain. There seems to be an ancient presence on this mountain. Perhaps from early Cherokee or even earlier Indians, who left their intricate carvings not far from here. After the Green Berets had finished with Eagle Creek, a local professor, Ed Buckner, took a group of experienced hikers up the trail. They planned on camping somewhat apart and building very large bonfires throughout the night. Snedden was still organizing the search from Cades Cove. He worked on approving new volunteers and making sure that fuel, supplies, and walkie-talkies were distributed to the group. At Cades Cove and at the top of the mountain, this was the day the base camp at Cades Cove was more formalized, and they started having intense nightly strategy meetings. Tony Stark, the regional chief of visitor protection, called into the meeting with the names of other high-ranking park officials who were waiting on standby when search leaders became too exhausted. He also wanted a status report and expense report so far. It was becoming clear that this search might be on for quite a while, and plans needed to be made to keep it going in a more organized way. The next day, on June 19th, search leaders were called in from other states. The total search numbers were estimated to be around 500 for the day. In the five days since Dennis had been missing, 1,000 other people had tried to join in the search at this point who had been rejected. They were sent home or held in reserve until they could get put into organized groups and ensure they wouldn't just get in the way of other parties or get lost. Snedden did tell the media that they were planning a larger search. He was gearing up for a search with about 800 people on the coming weekend, as they'd made plans with out-of-state park rangers and weekend SAR groups. This would give them enough search leaders to manage a larger amount of volunteers. By this point, the search area had covered about 55 square miles. The Eagle Creek area turned up no other clues the previous day, so the footprints were deemed a dead end. A casting of the prints was shown to the Martins, who decided the prints were too big, and experts decided the prints were likely from a tennis shoe, not the black Oxford-style shoes Dennis had been wearing. They determined the tracks were likely made by one of the Boy Scouts that had assisted during the search. In 2019, Dwight McCarter would criticize this dismissal of the footprint lead, saying, quote, They didn't find tracks from a bunch of kids. They found tracks from one kid. He was by himself. And none of the scouts who had been through were barefoot. He said Eagle Creek was absolutely a likely area Dennis could have gone to as the area along the creek looked like a trail. Quote, that would be reasonable, that he might have hit this trail. If it was dark, this looks like a trail. If you didn't have a flashlight, and you didn't know the terrain, and you're six years old, you'd be awful young to have to make those kinds of decisions on your own. McCarter also later talked about how two searchers had found a boy's footprint that could have been in the shoe Dennis was wearing near Pigeon River. But this wasn't really followed up on because the searchers had already been there and it was discounted as a searcher's footprint. But the family was not too interested in these leads. At the moment, they were focused on getting the rangers to investigate the psychics who had been calling in. The Martins were dedicated believers in the power of clairvoyance. The Green Berets were dispatched to check the most promising lead in the area between Forrester Ridge and Jenkins Trail. One, 
Mrs. Schwaller of Michigan had already called in with a prediction that she had already shared with the media, thus putting pressure on searchers to follow up. She said that they could find Dennis, quote, five miles southeast from the last area seen on stream by a waterfall, and that white pine trees are in the area. She said that she'd seen this in a dream, and that her dreams had come true before. The Green Berets had been sent into the area that could most likely fit the description. To quote the NPS summary of the case, quote, The search had turned up no evidence at all. Heavy pressure was being put on us by a good part of the public. There's nothing to do but check the prediction. The NPS disclosure listed the other psychic predictions that the family deemed credible. One, Jeffrey Owens predicted the boy was still alive and would have dreams detailing what he was doing, sitting by a log or making his way to a river for water. He would call daily with what his dreams were telling him. Jean Dixon, a well-known psychic at the time, also chimed in. She gave a detailed description of the turns Dennis had taken when he got lost, and helpfully stated he was in an area with few trees, which is just describing Spence Field. She said that he was still alive and they could find him near a waterfall in an area with white pine trees. It's a bit odd that both psychics mentioned white pine trees, but nevertheless, the searchers followed up on all of these leads. Park officials branched out to follow more practical leads as well. McCarter wrote in his journal that, quote, This day there are lookouts stationed in High Rock's tower that looks into Hazel Creek and at Shuck Stack Tower that looks into Eagle Creek. They are to look for buzzards and plot their location. Also, all pit toilets at Spence, Russell, Moline's, and other locations with these type pits are to be examined. That means lowering a searcher into them. Fortunately, I am not chosen for this duty. Checking vulture activity in pit toilets meant that park officials were now openly discussing the possibility that Dennis might not be alive. An unnamed park spokesman said, quote, the search will go on until we find the boy or his body. Park officials told the media that bear attacks were not likely, but if the boy were injured or unconscious, could be a possibility. The rattlesnakes and notoriously aggressive wild boar were more of a threat than the black bears. But even if rangers did not think a bear would have killed the boy, they would scavenge anything. That day, all searchers were to collect samples of bear or boar dung and bring it in to be analyzed for human remains. During a less misty part of the day, the Highway Patrol and Fire Department took William up in one of their helicopters with a bullhorn to try the plan they had been wanting to do with the airplane, but they quickly realized the bullhorn was not loud enough to be heard over the helicopter's engine. Nothing of note was found that day. The next day, June 20th, was supposed to be Dennis's seventh birthday. Much of the search leadership was switched out to give those in charge time to rest. The total men for the day was estimated at 780. The numbers bolstered by bringing in more National Guardsmen, as well as volunteers who had been following the story. Two-ton trucks brought volunteers up the Boat Mountain Trail, where jeeps brought them up the last gravel stretch. This was more efficient than taking jeeps the whole way, but rapidly destroyed the road. By 11 a.m. that day, everyone was being transported by air, while park rangers attempted to repair that service road with gravel. The search area was 4 miles wide and 14 miles long already, with plans to broaden to the southeast. Ranger Mike Myers talked about the difficulty of determining a logical search area for a child. Quote, you can pretty much figure out what an adult would do. Anybody used to this terrain would probably find a stream or a branch and follow it to the watershed line. But a small child, you just don't know what they'll do. They're so unpredictable. The Green Beret troops, about 65 still on site, were being moved to the Hawes Gap area, about 11 or 12 miles southeast of Spence Field. The unnamed ranger said they were being put there in order to get an early start in the morning. And as they were a smaller, more organized unit, they would mark off areas as they went, 
ensuring the areas they got to only needed to be searched once. They spent much of the day hiking to the difficult-to-reach area and sent soldiers rappelling down a cliff to cut down trees and clear out a heliport in the area to more easily bring people in. Many of the Martin family members were still staying in the stone shelter on top of Spence Field. They'd been there almost a week now, and the stone shelter was open to the elements on one side. The papers that managed to get to the search area interviewed them. William said, quote, The whole baffling thing is how he disappeared so fast. People suggested to me that maybe someone kidnapped him, but people don't just go up on a mountain in the wilderness to kidnap a kid. They spoke with Clyde, who had been tirelessly working to find Dennis as well. He said, quote, I keep looking for that boy. His bright little shirt appears over and over again, but he's never there. I say in my prayers that if I put my faith in God, that he will lead us to him, and I believe he will. I think Dennis can survive this unless he has fallen and hurt himself. In the woods around Spence Field, there are rock outcroppings and small cliffs. It's possible he fell and an animal carried his body away. Clyde was a teacher at Knoxville Middle School and said he planned on being extra protective of his students on field trips and outings from now on. Many of the searchers were in charge of rechecking Spence Field that day, McCarter among them. He wrote, quote, At the lower end of the field, we find an old mowing machine, the kind a horse would pull. At one point, searchers found an old windmill blade, and Clyde later told the media this was likely from the old Martin family homestead. They weren't finding Dennis, but they were finding bits and pieces of his family's old homestead. In Gatlinburg, locals and tourists alike were following the story. They talked about it at tourist spots or drove past the ranger base at Cades Cove to ask if Dennis had been found yet. Though the public had good intentions, it was hampering traffic from the searchers a bit. During the nightly strategy meeting around 8 that night, park officials decided to start blocking visitor traffic. Park officials made plans and tried to estimate the number of people who would be flocking to the park the next morning. Skip Trotter, the president of the Tennessee Association of Rescue Squads, said he could have 300 to 500 additional searchers on Spence Field. Snedden set up a detailed plan for if Dennis was found. They were to determine if the boy was dead or alive and declare him dead only if rigor mortis had set in. Otherwise, they should attempt to revive him. Then they were to call in the appropriate radio code for alive or dead. They were to climb to a tree and set up a flag, build fires, or for the military, set off smoke bombs. Then, if he was alive, the military would send someone down on a rope from the helicopter to bring the boy up on a stretcher. Or if he was dead, they were to guard the area until the coroner could be brought in. Ambulances were on standby if he was found alive. Despite all the planning... Park officials were not sure what they could do that hadn't already been done. An unnamed ranger was quoted in the Tennessean as saying, quote, We've run out of mountains to search in this area. Every square inch of the Spence Field area has been covered, and there is not one shred of evidence we have found that would indicate where this boy is or what has happened to him. Hundreds of people had got lost in the Smokies by then, but all of them had been found. Assistant Chief Ranger Ed Widmer said, quote, We have 12 to 20 persons get lost every year. Some just stray off a trail and are found soon. Some have been lost for days. But none has ever been missing as long as this boy. They had tried everything that had worked in the past and weren't sure what the numbers would bring to the search, aside from more confusion. Snedden was already making plans for what to do after the massive weekend search. He told the media that many of the forest rangers were working 18 hours a day on the search, and that the effort was not sustainable. He said that the search might have to be scaled back after the weekend. After the meeting, searchers began preparing for the intensive search that next day. A small group always camped at Spence Field for the night. Special forces cleared an area at a lower part of Spence Field so helicopters could land more easily below the cloud cover. Late that night, 200 additional Air National Guardsmen arrived by helicopter and set up for the next day. 
McGee Tyson Air Force Base shipped in two mobile communication trucks and 5,000 gallons of helicopter fuel and promised to provide for any additional communications or fuel needs. Some of the troops were switched out that day to relieve some men. As park officials prepared to accommodate several hundred searchers, one of Dennis's relatives decided to take things to a higher authority. That day, Mrs. Donald Martin sent a letter to President Nixon. It reads as follows. Mr. President, last Saturday, a seven-year-old child, Dennis Martin, was lost in the Great Smoky Mountains while camping with his family. Sadly, though hundreds of people are searching constantly for him, he has not been found. Among those who have not left the mountain, Bill and Clyde are the boy's father and grandfather, and several uncles who are approaching the ages of 70. They must find Dennis, either living or dead. My husband is among the men searching for his cousin, but I among those like the child's mother who can only wait and pray. By chance last night, as I lay awake, I read the enclosed account of your checkers and the elation over losing and finding your dog. Surely, I thought, a man with such compassion for an animal will understand the emotions, fear when there is a similar situation but involving a child. The men of the Martin family have loved the Smokies for over 50 years. It is a way of life for the older men. That this very place of inspiration should now become the site of tragedy is unbearable. The park rangers say that Dennis may still be alive, as children have vanished for longer periods than this in the mountains. He must be found. I pray that you can cause additional help to be asked to this effort. Signed, Mrs. Donald H. Martin. As the search ended that day, McCarter worked until nightfall. Though the preparations for the next day were impressive, he was starting to feel as though they might not find Dennis. Quote, We have no luck again today, and walked down to Ledbetter Trail at nightfall, feeling discouraged. Happy birthday, Dennis, wherever you are. Music is provided by Hex System. Major sources for this episode include Reddit, the Knoxville News Sentinel, and the Tennessean. For a full list of sources, as well as links to our sponsors and contributors, please see our show notes. Please rate or review on your chosen app and follow us on Twitter or Instagram at CompulsionCast to stay up to date on our latest episodes and news. See you in two weeks.